Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second Waikato Palato Pia Tari Eco. Um, we may have some people joining as we go along, and I think a couple people have to leave, so um, we'll just carry on. So I'm Wayne Naylor, I'm the Director of Nursing at Hospice Waikato. I'm facilitating the meeting today. Uh, I just wanted to start out by getting everybody to introduce themselves. And I will go um, from what I can see on the screen and start with um, Gwen. This, we will um, unmute you as we go around. Um, can you just, oh, just so to start off with, if you can unmute yourself and then we'll manage the mutes from there. Sounds better. Yeah, definitely. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gwen. I'm one of the community hospice nurses work in the Hamilton area. And I'm Anne Marie, a clinical nurse specialist, RPAs on nurse working for hospice. Thank you. Uh, next, we've got Ellie. Hello, everyone. My name is Ellie Cordova. I work at the Echo Institute in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I'm just here to see your wonderful group in action. So, thank you so much for welcoming me. Thank you very much for joining us, Ellie. It's good to have you back again. Uh, David, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yes, can't see you. Oh, you unfortunate people. <laughs> uh, I'll work on that. Yes, I'm here. I'm David Wilson. I'm from Fitianga. Thank you. Um, and then we have Brian. There he is. Hi, I'm Brian Enzo. I'm the medical director here at um, Hospice Waikato. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, and we'll come to the hub group now. Do you want to start, Tiffany? Hi, I'm Tiffany Kane. I'm with Society Support. Morena. My name is Debbie Barham, previous GP, now a, a palliative care trainee. Good morning. I'm Karen Roberts, team leader for the Community Nursing Service at Hospice Waikato. Good morning. I'm Andrea Jones, Hospice Waikato Education Team. I'm Wayne, I introduced myself already. <laughs> <laughs> Lara Hoskins, palliative care physician here at hospice and at the hospital. Morning everyone, Vivian, uh, Family Services Manager at Hospice Waikato. Good morning, uh, Karen O'Reilly, Social Worker, Hospice Waikato. Hi, Stuart Brown, uh, palliative care physician. Yeah. And hiding on the side, we have Alison Brown, who's our quality coordinator, and Tuck, who's also helping with the IT support. <coughs> You go to the next slide, if I can come on. Oh. Just um, a few notices before we start, just to remind everybody that the patient cases that are going to be discussed um, are de-identified, so we don't want to use any patient identifiable information when we are presenting or discussing the cases. Uh, we are recording today's session for educational purposes, so just to remember, and I will try and do it as well, that when you're speaking to look at your camera so we can see you. Um, we will be managing the microphones, muting and unmuting, um, just so we don't have any background noise. Uh, there's no one on telephone, so that's fine. And just our thing, um, because we're recording it and so that everyone knows who everyone else is, can you just identify yourself when you are speaking? Uh, for those people who need education points, this activity is um, endorsed for 1.5 CME credits through College of GPs. We will provide certificates for nurses and other staff as well for professional development hours. Um, we, um, Andrea will collect your names and send out certificates after the meeting. And that's just our agenda for today. So we'll start shortly with a didactic teaching session from um, Lara, and then we have two case presentations. Um, yeah. 
So without further ado, I'll introduce Dr. Lara Hoskins, who's going to do our didactic teaching session this morning. Good morning, everyone. Morena, um, we're going to look at dyspnea this morning. And if people have other topics that we want to do, we're keen to hear from you. So we thought about what we thought might be useful to people. So if we're not hitting the mark, then let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. And this is a common symptom. So I thought it would be a useful one to cover. Often we think about pain, but sometimes we don't think very much about breathlessness. Go. Do um, let us know if there's any technical troubles. Um, you can send a chat message through to our tech person if you're not receiving this information on your screen. But I like to keep, we have some objectives today. Um, I want everyone to be able to talk to a patient about dyspnea and form a management plan with them and know the common medications, including dosage, is in managing dyspnea. Much of the, there's some really good information on dyspnea in the Palliative Care Handbook, which is available for download from the Hospice New Zealand website. And I put that at the end of the, the website address for it at the end of the presentation. But if you just Google Hospice New Zealand, it's reasonably easy to find it under resources. So firstly, a little bit about dyspnea, about shortness of breath. And I think it's really important to know that it is a sub, it's a feeling. It's how patients feel, not whether they're tachypneic. It's not about their saturations. It's that they feel short of breath. And with that, it's really important that in taking a history, we ask the patient about what that feels like to them. And taking a history can be part of the management, that a patient is heard and understood and that we take it seriously. Just taking time to take a history can be very important to a patient that they have been heard. And I like to think of dyspnea as that discrepancy between how hard I am breathing and how hard I think I should be breathing. And the example I use with patients often is that the oncology ward at Waikato Hospital is on the fifth floor and I'm not very fit and I sometimes choose to take the stairs, I should I'll probably more often choose to take the stairs and walk up to the four flights to the fifth floor from the first floor and arrive breathing faster than normal. And I think, oh, yeah, I should do that more often, I should get up for a run more often. And I'm not surprised that I'm breathing as hard as I am. The reality and expectation and reality are matched. But I walk into the nurse's office and occasionally, fortunately not so frequently lately, a nurse will say to me, are you okay, Lara? They see me breathing hard and wonder what's going on. And I say, oh, I don't, it's okay, it's okay. I just climbed up the stairs, should do that more often. But if I was sitting here now talking with you, breathing as hard as I do when I climb those four flights of stairs, then I'd go, what's going on? I've just been sitting here and I'm working hard. If I'm working that hard sitting here, what happens when I try and walk down the hallway or try and climb a flight of stairs? And talking to patients about this, I often say, look, if I put an oxygen sats probe on my finger when I've done those four flights, and I think I'll be reading 98, 99, doing well, I'm getting enough oxygen. If I put the sats probe on my finger here, I would also have good numbers. And for lots of patients, they're short of breath, but they're not hypoxic. And I think that's really important that they understand um, that they're working hard, but they're doing it. They're succeeding in getting that oxygen in them. And it is a bit different when they are working really hard and not um, achieving the target saturations, but that's a different that was a slightly different conversation, but I think it, we need to help them to understand, hey, you're breathing hard, but you're doing it. Good on you. Management. I tried to find a reusable photo of a doctor and the idea being here that um, the doctor can be the drug. Um, so we're going to talk about non-pharmacological management a lot um, and a little bit about the drugs. Um, 
So the first thing is help, helping the patient understand what's going on because shortness of breath can feel like, um, it doesn't actually feel like drowning or something like that, but patients often extrapolate and say, oh, this is terrible. And it is a yucky feeling. And then that panic adds to that feeling that I can't get breath, what's going on? I often tell my patients that panic takes a lot of energy. So when you're short of breath, you add panic into it, you increase your ox oxygen demand. <laughs> and so then you need to breathe harder to release the energy to panic, which I think is a useful, it, again, it depends on the patient. Some people don't like that kind of technical information and others um, that's perfect for them. So always tailored. And so it's about um, giving them the information they need for some, it'll be explaining what's going on in their lungs. Often patients think that something's going to happen that we would never dream of or think likely happening medically. Uh, I'm surprised with the number of patients, say, with cancer who say, oh, am I going to die by a heart attack? I'm like, oh, nah. <laughs> it's very, very unlikely. Um, and so I think, again, with shortness of breath, it's exploring what they think this means. Um, Again, taking it gently. Um, you don't go, oh, what do you think this means? And they're like, you're the doctor. Um, so, re so reassurance, I guess, not false reassurance. Yes, this breathing is going to be hard. Yes, it may get worse, but I think that we'll be able to manage it. Those sort of things. Reverse the reversible causes. If there's a nasty chest infection and it's really appropriate to treat with antibiotics, treat it with antibiotics. If they've got crashing heart failure and it's appropriate to increase their diuretics, increase the diuretics. But think about, the, as always, the risks and the benefits of that. But for a patient who's anemic, the anemia may be contributing, but sometimes we like to focus on the reversible bit and fail to see that actually the vast majority of their symptom is caused by an irreversible part. Um, and just weighing those things up. And you will all have experience in that, so I'm not trying to tell you what's the right bit for anyone. I think sometimes draining a pleural effusion can be helpful, but sometimes actually it doesn't make a big difference. And certainly when we're thinking about doing repeat procedures, did they benefit last time? Knowing that there may be a placebo benefit. And if we drain Pleural fluid, there's always a small chance we'll give them a pneumothorax and so make them more short of breath. How hard is it for them to travel for that procedure? Again, we're considering all those factors. My favourite intervention for breathlessness. Does anyone see me on camera or not? Or is it they only seeing me? Oh, I, have to, I have to describe it with words. Is um, air moving over the face. And so that can be opening a window um, or using a fan. And I think that this is particularly good for um, those panic episodes when you're feeling really short of breath and just can't get anything in. And in those moments, often the caregiver, whoever's close to the person and with them, starts to get pretty panicked as well. They see their family member, their dear friend, upset, distressed, and that helplessness that comes with it. So in those moments, I think it would be quite good to give the caregiver a job and a manual fan, whether that's a piece of paper, the newspaper, a magazine, to vigorously wave. And perhaps then the vigour of that activity ties nicely with the breathlessness at that moment when they're the most stressed, the patient's the most stressed, they can fan vigorously. And as their arms start to get tired and the patient's breathlessness perhaps improves a little bit, then that sort of matched up. But certainly a pedestal fan or sometimes a handheld electric fan can be great. Much of the benefit non-hypoxic patients and probably some hypoxic patients get from oxygen is just having air moving over their face. There are sensors in the skin on the face which detect that air movement and somehow send a message to the brain that says, oh, don't worry, there's air moving, you're going to be right. And I think that's an important thing to explain because many patients will have tried some oxygen from an ambulance staff, from a nurse, from somewhere in hospital. They go, oh, the oxygen is the only thing that works. 
So I think that's important to know. The role of oxygen, we should reserve oxygen only for those who are hypoxic, so sitting down with saturations down 88% or less, but knowing that oxygen is not the cure. And many patients with COPD who have domiciliary oxygen for extension of their life expectancy will not feel any less short of breath taking it. So we need to be careful that we do not make a patient dependent on oxygen and therefore limit their life because they feel stuck to that machine. Um, use it as a help, um, not as a hindrance. And here in the Waikato, then hospice does have some oxygen concentrators and our criteria for those use, for the use is the same as the respiratory department at Waikato Hospital. Um, they did do a lovely study where they got oxygen concentrators and randomly made half of them give room air and half give oxygen and the patient didn't know. Everyone felt better with something blowing up their nostrils um, and there was no significant difference between whether it was oxygen or air for the non-hypoxic. Cool. So I think it's really important for patients that we, they know what to do, particularly if they're having significant episodes of dyspnea. And there's one thing about the day-to-day -day dyspnea, but what to do if they have a sudden moment of severe breathlessness. So if you get short of breath doing something, you can try rest. Some patients place chairs all over their house so that they can um, sit down, walk a couple of metres, sit, walk a couple of metres, sit, which is a pain, but if it gives them independence. So knowing that if you rest, your breathing will improve. It doesn't, it's not rocket science, but it can be really helpful. Explaining why they're short of breath and what can be done about it. That fan, really helpful. And I think in so many ways, and the data is increasing on this, the response of the person close to them has a huge impact on the patient's experience and symptoms. We're seeing this in chronic pain. They're now researching um, caregiver response to, say, spouse response to pain, and then having interventions to address the caregiver or spouse, and that way improve the pain management. So I think um, when you're panicking, having someone who panics is along with you will ramp things up. Um, easy said, hard to do to calm people down because it does look, yeah, but having a plan when they get short of breath, do this and do this, sometimes even having to go and turn on a fan, a doing thing can be helpful. And then medication and I think helping them to know when to use it and that we sometimes exploit appropriately the placebo effect of medication. So sometimes it's keeping the dose of medication low so that there can be a doing of getting a drug at that moment. And then when do they call the ambulance or phone hospice or phone uh, the district nurse? So knowing at what level and how to access that. And for some patients, maybe even having a plan with the ambulance staff because they feel panicked and maybe they can go there and maybe not transport all of them to the hospital. Medication, can I actually talk about it? And I just did my medication thing, just wanted to reinforce like, non-drug strategies first. And then medication should be low-dose opioid, low-dose opioid. Um, and then maybe, if you really have to, a benzodiazepine. And the Cochrane Review on this said that there's evidence for low-dose opioids, but there's not evidence for benzodiazepines. Um, and this can be quite different from what we actually see in practice. We often see a lot of benzodiazepines in palliative care and hospice. We've prescribed a lot of benzodiazepines. We have staff um, who are very generous and encouraging the use of benzodiazepines. But I think that we need to relook at this and some of the messages that GPs are already aware of and reducing benzodiazepine use for anxiety and keeping them specially for certain circumstances rather than every day, we should be taking that same learning and applying it a bit more to our palliative care patients. 
So the, the opioid with data is morphine, but the other is probably, it's probably a class effect. So more, uh, a bit like Brian's talk, I speak morphine good, it's well known. Um, we can get those faces of last time for those of us who are here. Uh, and we're looking at one or two milligrams orally, four times a day, I've got a duration of action of four to six hours. So that's the kind of quantities we're thinking of. And so if morphine's not an appropriate drug for renal failure or other reasons, then perhaps oxycodone, one milligram QID orally, or fentanyl. Again, fentanyl doesn't often cut the mustard because it's so short acting, we can only give it subcutaneously or sublingually, and sublingually is fiddly. Um, so not great. And again, having to have a subcutaneous bolus when you're feeling short of breath, it really does ramp up the sort of medicalization and the, oh, we need something serious. Um, whereas a little bit of morphine syrup seems to be a kind of um, less interventional thing. And so perhaps in renal failure, if I have a patient who has some renal failure, I might choose the oxycodone, even though it wouldn't be ideal in, renal, in severe renal failure, but just so that I can have something that lasts a little bit longer. We're using tiny doses, and so they're probably going to cope. If they're having it regularly, then maybe they'll need some long acting, but wouldn't it be lovely if we had five milligrams BD of long acting <laughs> morphine? I guess that's the other thing, knowing uh, do we really need to go up to 20 milligrams a day or can we just use Elixir? Um, uh, there, there's discussion and different practice about whether you titrate it for d dyspnea. I would titrate opioids up if a patient had pain, but I would want to be convinced that a bit more is going to actually make a difference. I think many patients will be short of breath on a, um, if they're still short of breath on a low dose and you double that and you double that, they'll probably actually be just as short of breath. If they're needing it for pain, then take it up. If they're already on 30 milligrams twice a day of long acting morphine, there's probably not a lot of benefit of adding extra. Although, if they need something to do, a milligram of morphine, Alexa, four times through the day, they can take it when they're short of breath. It's probably a low risk intervention that might have a good placebo effect and help limit the total opioid milligrams. So. Benzodiazepines um, go with something you know. I particularly favour countable tablets over bottles of drops because I think that we have a better sense of, you know, you can take a couple of these in a day or this many in a week, you know, to save it for when you're really short of breath and nothing else is working. Um, has a role and we should do what general practice has been told about um, benzos, think about the duration. Um, yes, they patients do become dependent on them and I like to save them for when they're more short of breath and not just, um, uh, if we use them a lot up early, particularly with those who have prognosis of a couple of years, some of our COPD patients or pulmonary fibrosis, then when the end comes, um, they are going to need huge doses. Um, so let's focus on those non-pharmacological things. Certainly clonazepam drops have been very popular and we in palliative care, certainly in the Waikato, have encouraged generous use of them. And I think it hasn't always been beneficial. Um, and certainly we're now staining teeth. And um, so let's think about that. Sometimes you do want that long action from the clonazepam, um, one or two drops of, so 0 0.1, 0 0.2 milligrams that will just give them a little bit sitting in the background might be helpful, but more often we're wanting something to help at that moment, get them through that panic attack type thing. So um, there's more information available in the palliative care handbook. Oh, that white doesn't show up. Ooh, uh, um, really helpful resource available at hospice. But I'm keen to hear comments and questions. We have... Yep, so we have... A few minutes if anyone uh, who's dialed in has any comments or questions they would like to ask or put forward. Just give us a wave if you do. Right. Anyone
anyone um, in the hub group here have any comments they'd like to make? All been adequately covered, I yes. think. Yes. Okay. Uh, in that case, we will keep moving on then and we'll go to our first um, case presentation today, which is going to be presented by Dr. Brian Hensor. I'll hand over to you, Brian, we'll just bring the case study up. We'll just unmute you, just hold on a second. <laughs> Let's see, unmute it. Can you unmute from your end, Brian? I, is that right? Yeah, yep, that's good. There were, some, there were some people wanting to see Gwen <laughs> and then go to work. <laughs> Gwen's on, first on the agenda. No, Gwen's last. You're up first, Brian. Am I? Yeah. yeah. Not negotiable. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Good try. It's fine. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, the yeah, the, the, the case. Um, yeah, the, the presentation I've uh, I've got really is. Um, uh, put out there to see if somebody somebody recognises this this uh, this scenario to stop me going down uh, various rabbit holes to do with um, medication. Uh, the the two key questions I've got is is, is uh, what we do with this um, uh, with the pain, but also to do with. Uh, the the bigger picture and, and the, the presentations. Now, um, Wayne, just remind me, I'm um, presenting this whole thing in five minutes and then we are going for clarification, is that right? Yeah, we have around 25 minutes for the whole case discussion, so you don't need to rush it. No, okay. Um, I met this. I met this woman um, in a in a rural clinic a um, uh, few times, and it was uh, an early referral because people thought that uh, she would run into problems before too long. And the woman I saw come in the door was a bit different from the the one that I imagined uh, in my mind. Uh, she's 80 years old, but I sort of think of her as sort of in her 60s. And she's been uh, boxing on uh, medically without uh, a lot of comorbidities until she got this pain in her, uh, in her chest which was reasonably uh, quickly diagnosed as a adenocarcinoma of, well, as a cancer, first of all, before they put a needle and scanned her, uh, but a substantial one to be carrying around the sort of 60 centimetre, uh, 60 by 80 in the liver. Uh, she lives by herself in, uh, out in the country. She has a a, uh, a male partner who lives close by, but she's by herself. A daughter in Auckland and a, a son in Coromandel. Uh, still out and about, uh, a, a social woman. Uh, she enjoys her cooking and she enjoys getting out. The multiple drugs and sensitivities was the banner, um, banner concern. So I saw her before her first oncology appointment, and I'm not even sure at that stage whether uh, they had histology, and it was for uh, previous, uh, it was for the drug in intolerances. 
Uh, it's sort of interesting that she has come through her chemotherapy uh, without any problems. It's not difficult, particularly chemotherapy, but uh, it's been okay. In the past, she describes uh, she describes Crips um, as in chronic regional pain uh, problems and showed me the wasting that still existed. And, and it was treated by a carpal tunnel release and it, and it was like, okay, um, uh, okay. Uh, recurrent headaches and she has been using nortriptyline uh, for that. Various, uh, various small little uh, bits and pieces, uh, uh, aches, uveitis, uh, skin problems. Okay. So the, the, the holistic assessment is not particularly holistic, to be honest. Um, the background, the background uh, uh, ache uh, in her liver, uh, she, eight out of, it was 8 out of 10 at the Edmonton symptom assessment when she came in to clinic. Uh, it, one couldn't tell particularly um, uh, how uncomfortable she was. Uh, she also got some very severe colicky sort of pain on top of that intermittently. I'll just see if I've written it down. Uh, that was associated with eating. I haven't written that down. Um, her sleep was poor, always was poor. And then we go into the, um, to the, the, the medication reactions. When she woke from surgery, she hallucinated on that. Uh, she got a similar sort of thing not so severe with, with codeine and, and that sort of always backs it up in my mind that this is a, a woman that, that can't tolerate uh, morphine. Ibuprofen and abdominal pain is like, yeah, that's fine, I'm not worried about that. Stematol was a really unusual, um, she had stematol I think as part of the migraine uh, thing uh, when she was out working and she had to go home and she describes uh, giddiness and, and a lot of saliva, a lot of uh, drooling, which was one of those sort of unusual sort of symptoms and, uh, and yes, it's a side effect for stematol. Maxwell and roxithromycin GI side effects, that's fine. An interesting sort of thing that people might comment on for this woman that's ended up with this large adenocarcinoma of the liver was over the, over, over years over years um, she's drunk less and less as if her uh, metabolism is just slowly giving up the ghost and her daughter was with us and and uh, uh, substantiated this and leads her to believe that she's had this liver cancer for years and years. She has had health in the past. She tolerates a little bit of Nortrip, 10 milligrams. Then we started uh, to some opiates for this 8 out of 10 pain, given that uh, tramadol is also intolerant. I'm not sure I've got tramadol as an intolerant thing. So, we, so uh, we couldn't use, we can use paracetamol. Can we use anti-inflammatories? No, not really. I guess we had the COX-2 still uh, in the background. Uh, and, and then we tried oxycodone half a, half a milligram. And just as a deliberately homeopathic dose. And uh, that was okay. And so she tried it for a few days and then intermittently two or three times a day shifted up to one milligram, it was too much. And in fact, taking went back to half a milligram and half a milligram three times a day. After a few days, she described herself as getting uh, drowsy slash comatose and uh, went to the hospital. So in a few of these symptoms, the, the descriptions are very dramatic. And uh, 
homatose is a, is a dramatic uh, thing in my mind, but uh, it's not really corroborated. She lives by herself um, uh, by other people. Anyway, uh, the next time she came, uh, she wasn't going to take oxycodone anymore. And so we tried fentanyl nasal spray, 10 micrograms. It was not tolerable. It was worse than anything, but it did reduce the pain down to six out of 10. And so the fentanyl was um, abandoned. And then the host, then um, oncology slash primary uh, care took up the, the methadone option, which was the last one. And she got five milligrams and she described that as a fatal mistake. And uh, wouldn't take take that again. Steroids are given intermittently for uh, for the chemotherapy. So the the, the picture is uh, a woman who has every reason to have um, uh, significant pain, and whose presentation was with uh, pain, whose description of the pain is is, is not. Uh, particularly consistent with what I'm uh, seeing in terms of the severity, although she is quite tender. The reactions to the drugs are sort of consistent, but they're, they're, they're surprisingly um, tentative, and I'm not sure whether that's patient or whether that's uh, drugs. And there's this unusual thing about the gradual intolerance of, of Alcohol. I'm very aware that I don't have a lot of background information with her, and I have talked to her uh, GP, who also has a, um, a lack of information. And so, part of this discussion may be um, that that uh, you suggest places that we might to, um, uh, help this help us to help me understand um, uh, this woman in this somewhat unusual uh, presentation. I met her once with a daughter um, who's a sort of a Mission Bay, Auckland um, uh, yuppie. <laughs> well, she's, very concerned, she's very concerned about her mother and uh, yeah, the symptoms are somewhat escalated, perhaps. The son's not so involved. I saw her again uh, without her daughter, uh, and it was a much more relaxed conversation, but still I'm ending up thinking, look, I really don't know quite what to do with this woman, and I'm aware that I very easily dive down the rabbit hole of trying a bit of this and trying a bit of that, but I'm not sure whether I should. So. Uh, that's putting it out there for discussion and clarification. Okay, we might um, go out to the spoke sites and see if anyone has any um, questions or clarifications for Brian at this stage. We'll just hold back on any recommendations until we've had some questions. So David's got a question. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Yeah, hi, David. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, it's just a, a question for you guys mainly. Um, if this lady is getting hallucinations with the morphine, then would giving her some haloperidol at the same time cure the hallucinations and make it more tolerable? Uh, question two for you guys is... Um, uh, the new, because I'm from the Coromandel, do we know if she's tried cannabis from her son uh, and would it be helpful, given that it's going to be now legal in Canada? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's, it's, so, skipping in first with the haloperidol, um, I've never been driven really to that stage that I would give haloperidol for somebody uh, that I didn't have to give morphine for morphine too, and I know we do give it for hallucinations. Uh, I would always want to try getting her off the morphine uh, first. Does it help? Look, I throw that one over to the to the floor. I'm never been. 
I've ne I don't, I've ne don't have the feeling that I've ever fixed anybody by giving them haloperidol. Tom. I've had, I've had at least one case where it has been beneficial, but I take your point, it's far preferable to maybe try a different opioid. We sometimes start haloperidol as a prophylactic antiemetic um, with morphine. We're very comfortable to do that. Why don't we do it with, yeah. Um, uh, and that may be something that we have um, forced back onto, but I wouldn't, I still wouldn't use haloperidol um, morphine because it's just so clear with her in the coating. The cannabis, um, uh, yeah, so look, I, I, I thought of giving her a referral to see you um, about that because I think that is um, something that I that crossed my mind and we did we did discuss actually, um, but I'm not going to tilray her. I'm not going to prescribe. Um, it's not worth the expense and, I, and the whole psychoactive thing for this woman. Uh, look, I, I don't know. I mean, that's that's one of those sort of things. I would be really interested to know. Uh, whether it's helpful or harmful uh, for her. And I know th that we're not supposed to be getting on to answers, Wayne. Um, yeah. That's right. Does anyone else uh, on the spoke sites have any uh, questions or clarifications for Brian? No. Anyone in the Hub team want to ask any questions? Yep, Debbie. Uh, thanks, Brian. You mentioned um, that history of sort of over-dramatising things and, and her pain rating score of 8 out of 10. <clears throat> I'm wondering what her idea of what is tolerable is. What is she hoping to achieve? What are her expectations about this pain? Yeah. Because my worry is that, that her expectations are going to be out of keeping with what, what we might be able to provide to, and that's that that gap is the bit we're going to have to work on. Yeah, and, and yeah, and I mean, that's a very good question. And I, and I haven't put it to her in those words, and I would like to, uh, because the second time I saw her uh, having failed with the, uh, these very small doses of oxycodone, uh, I was expecting to be a much unhappier woman than I than I got. And, and in a way, she is accepting of her unusual status and that, uh, and that uh, we did talk about keeping busy and stuff as, um, uh, as pain relief. Uh, but you're right, I, I had clarifying her expectations uh, would be useful. Yeah, so in the answer, no, I can't tell you what her expectations are. Lara Hoskins here. Um, uh, interesting case, Brian, a uh, tricky one. I just wondered how she, did you get a sense of how she's managed her headaches? I know you said she's used the nortriptyline, but clearly she's had the Crips, which, which had a definitive treatment, but there's probably a time when she was managing various pains in her own way. Did you get a sense of how she would, how she copes with pains? She does? Yeah, she copes. Um, uh, her headaches have been very good for a long time and, and uh, she was happy with the nortriptyline and she felt they were starting to come back again. She was going to try the nortriptyline, pushing it up to 20. And I, no, she was going to try pushing it up to 15 alternate days. And uh, I am not sure how that has gone. Mm. Um, some things are yeah, very colourfully uh, described and that reaction with the, the stemital was very colourful. Yeah, the reactions to the opiates are very colourful, um, but yet she doesn't have a huge list of comorbidities. Um, she's got a huge list of, of drug reactions. Um, and uh, she is, you know, fit and active and boxing on. She's done what she needs to do. Hmm. Yeah, so she's not a she's not crippled chronic pain sort of 
And I don't, I don't believe it was a Crips. I'm not sure what, it doesn't sound like a Crips to me. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes, Stuart Brown, uh, thanks very much. A very difficult case. Uh, I've come across people who over the years are very sensitive to medications, especially opioids. Um, and I think sometimes you have to go with almost homeopathic doses, it seems to work for some people. You know, it's hard to even divide the medicine up. Sorry, say that again. Sure. Sometimes you have to go with very small, regular but very small doses. Yes. Homeopathic, you know, going down and down. And sometimes for these people that seems to work. I just want the, the methadone, um, just, just taking one thing, yeah. methadone, uh, five milligrams. What was the fatal mistake? What, what symptoms did she have at five, twice a day? She, I mean, for instance, she might be able to have a very, very small dose of methadone that would work for her, like 0.5 BD or something like that. But I was wondering what the symptoms she had with methadone were. Uh, look, I, I, I think it was a, a, a dysphoric sedation. Mm. And, I, I, and I'm, yeah, I'm just worried that we missed the boat by essentially overdosing mm. you know, with, with a solid dose rather than starting off on a, as you say, a homeopathic dose would have been, um, yeah. And so we may have lost the, chance to use methadone but, I, but I, I hope not it'd be interesting to hear some discussion about with her about whether she would try it again in a tenth of the dose that she tried before yeah Tom yeah. Um, I hate to bring it up almost each time but these cases it makes you wonder about um, approaching the pain from a different um, uh, giving the, the pain relief through a different uh, modality. And um, I hate, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of transdermal patches, as you know, but buprenorphine may be as a low dose. Yeah, uh, I hear mine. And, it, and not another tablet might be more no. acceptable to this lady. Yeah. Yeah. So we're sort of, we can't help ourselves, Wayne. We just got to talk. Oh, no, I was just going to say. <laughs> that's right. If no one else has any um, questions, then we can certainly move into um, any recommendations. So, Tom started the ball rolling, which is great. Does anyone else in the spoke sites have any thoughts about um, how Brian might approach this? David? It's just uh, you didn't go on to the pregabal in gabapentin. Uh, you didn't mention that at all. Yep. Yep. How does that sound, um, Brian? She hasn't tr tried any. I don't. I. It, yeah. Uh, uh, I think. <laughs> I don't really have to go back. I, to like, yes. I have in my mind that she has, but I haven't written it down. But yes, oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, what's the smallest dose of. Uh, and so my understanding is that one is, is neither safer to use for this woman than the other. Would, I mean, I could... No. Um, uh, can, can I comment? Yeah. Um, I, was, I was always told that pregabalin was just the drug company trying to make more money by taking, changing the molecule a tiny bit and then keeping it in patent. And so I was very cynical about it. But blow me sideways, it actually works uh, better than the other one. The trouble is that pregabalin... Um, starts at a dose that we can get at 75 milligrams, which is probably too high for this sensitive lady, unless you could break the tablet up or, or sprinkle, mix the powder with something. Um, I think the dosage of the gabapentin is easier to start at a low dose. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Tom, no. Yeah, I was, I was just... Oh, is that okay? Okay, I didn't know that. Sorry. We do have the renal dose of 25 to start I with. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Sorry. But they come in 25s and 50s and 75s. So okay. we do have some op options to titrate that slowly. Yeah, my mistake. Right. I presume we can chop up 25 and a half. <laughs> or not sure. if we can. Yeah. They come in a capsule, don't they? I, I don't know that we can. Okay. Tip it out and cut it with a... What do you call it? $20 bill or a... 
<laughs> you may be able to open the capsules. Yeah, <laughs> the capsules. Um, that's right. Well, it, it's worth remembering that I think the last time I looked, you need to remember that the smallest dose, 25 BD of pregabalin, is about the equivalent of 100 TDS of gabapentin, which again, you know, for a frail patient is still, you know, sometimes enough, a reasonable dose to be starting. So you've got to think your equivalencies as well. Yeah. It's interesting. I, she's not frail. I mean, I, this is this is what I'm. I, I hear myself saying this, that I'm presenting. A, but you look at her and you think, this is a woman that's sort of soaking up her capsidabine and her gemcitabine, and and you know, why do my drugs upset her? And, and, <laughs> there is this fundamental lack of fairness in the world. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yes, she is she's vulnerable, but. You know, for an eighty-year-old, she's not not frail, but in something about her, something about her is very frail. And I'm not, and I'm part of this. Is is it a metabolic thing, or is it a is is it um, a functional thing? Yeah, it's something. It sounds like it sounds like a metabolism thing, but it's compounded by uh, the way she presents her stories. Yep. I think that it's often, as you say, a combination, and I think that the psychological component is significant, and I wonder if sometimes patients come to symptom management drugs with this expectation. It's almost like they read the packet insert and go, which one I'm going to get? Um, and, and so they're sort of hyper-vigilant for something that might be a side effect, and that sort of ramps it up. I'm not saying, oh, she's had some pretty good going side effects, not saying that's the whole picture. Yeah, I don't know what you mean that they just look. It's as if with the Cape Sider being perhaps it's like, well, I have to endure this. Yeah, a tough woman and and uh, get on with things, woman. So whatever side effects from the Cape Sider thing, just got to plow through. But the symptom management drags like oh, oh. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And so am I reacting too fast to the eight out of ten? Actually, and if I didn't ask her eight out of ten and I just looked at her, would I would I be wanting to give her? opiates at all, you know, and perhaps I should be um, uh, distracting her from the okay. pain. So Debbie here, Brian, um, I, I think that's the approach that I would take, that A, the, we are getting down a rabbit hole of what opioid can this woman have, yeah. but is opioid the, the issue here that I think there are some non-opioid things to consider, like, you know, if she's got an obstructed biliary tree, is that going to be stented? Um, we've got steroid options. There are other options outside of opioids that medically manage manageable options. My other concern is that the focus on medication takes the focus off her function, and, and you're telling us that her function is actually quite good, despite this pain rating scale. Yeah. So, my approach would probably be to focus least on worrying about what the pain score is and and establishing an expectation in terms of function what is it that this woman wants to be able to do and it may be that that she will be able to do that with pain that i'm not sure the goal is to completely eradicate pain if we can shift the goal and make it something a little less pain rating score focused <laughs> we might get some traction and whose whose role would that be? I yeah. Just, yeah. Um, I think that's probably a multidisciplinary approach. That ideally, in the ideal world, we would have a clinical psychologist and we would have a, a GP with an hour of time. And the reality is, we don't. So it's probably having a consensus that that might be a broad approach we take, and anybody involved with this woman can follow that. Yeah. Um, that approach. The reality is we, we may see her, what, once a, a month in an outpatient clinic setting. Her GP is going to see her more often than that. The oncology team are going to see her more often than that. They may have access to the psychology services through oncology. Um, but communicating that approach in those discussions and that goal is something that can be shared and not one person has to take ownership for driving that other than the patient. Sure. Can I just add something, Brian Viv here? Um, I'm sorry I had to pop out for a call, but I might have missed something relevant. But um, it's what is it stopping her doing, which is following what 
Debbie's saying, without the pain rating, how's this limiting your life, which has been very active right this second, and what medication might aid in activity, as well as distraction? I think that's all really relevant. Yeah, what's happening for her emotionally and mentally. Um, her rating might be equally something to do with those levels, emotional and mental, as, as pain. How's her body reading pain? Uh, I've got like some it, of those tricks if I it's been really tricky. With her. Yeah. It's been really tricky because you got here because people were preparing for the future. Yeah. And I think that then leads us when you see someone to act now when it was really about future proofing. And sometimes the sensitive patients when their pain is more severe tolerate the opioids better. Yes, you're right. Yes, you're yes, you're right. And and certainly um I did want to find something that she could possibly tolerate and at a very low dose, she does tolerate a little bit of oxy, and so we will, uh, when the time comes, perhaps have to use that. Although I do take Tom's point with the patch. Um, uh, that is still something under our, our sleeve or under our shirt or wherever you put them here. <laughs> I think the, the advantage of catching her early, though, is that very often with difficult pain situations, we have this, you know, we've tried everything, nothing's working, now we'll try the psychological intervention. Yeah. Actually, up front, the psychological interventions are as effective, and if we have the opportunity to play up the importance of the non-opioid approaches to managing her pain from an early stage, yeah. that can be really advant advantageous. Yeah. Okay. Good. Hopefully all that has been very helpful to you, Brian. We need to move on to our next case, uh, if that's okay. So our second case is going to be presented by Gwyn Bassett, who's one of our community uh, hospice nurses. So uh, when you're ready, Gwyn, just make sure you're unmuted and you can take it away. Good morning, everybody. So I just want to talk about a patient which I've named John, which obviously is not his real name. And the questions I'd like to have be answered are, when is the appropriate time to tell John he is dying? Who should be the one to tell John that he's dying? And who should be the key person responsible for overseeing John's care? So I've met John only three times so far, and he's a 56-year-old gentleman that was diagnosed with stage four colon adenocarcinoma back in 2014. Um, he had it surgically excised and had adjuvant chemotherapy, um, which he had capcitabine. He started off with capcitabine and the oxalic fatin, but couldn't tolerate the oxalic fatin, so just had the capcitabine. And then he ended up having um, yearly colonoscopies, which were clear. In that September 2017, also clear, and he had a normal CT staging of his chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And then he had a, he was a very active man, and he had a fall off of his mountain bike in April 2018, and um, ended up having a chest X-ray, which we found an incidental mass. He also had shoulder pain, which he put down to having a fall off his bike. Then he ended up having a CT, which, um, which showed that the lung mass um, had to static distances and ended up having a bronchoscopy to confirm that the lung mass was actually consistent with metastatic colon adenocarcinoma as opposed to a newly CA lung. The PET scan confirmed that he had lung lesions and bony mets and uh, mets in his left scapula as well. He seen his oncologist who offered him frog free chemo and John's reluctant to take the chemo due to the fact he had bad side effects from his previous chemo back in 2014 and he also um, then went to an oncologist up in Auckland who also suggested that he has this frog free. Since then he's been under the radiation oncologist and had um, multiple fractions of radiotherapy to T1 to T3. Plus, he had um, a one-off fraction to his scapula. He has been in, into hospital and had a chest infection and found to have E. coli. They did another scan in there, and it showed that he's got further bony mets 
and also um, potentially um, malignancy of his liver as well now. So from a treatment point of view, obviously he's previously had the um, surgery and the chemotherapy and uh, radiotherapy. He also has vitamin C infusions, which it can be anything from one to three a week. He goes for ozone therapy. He has the THC, which he self funds. He also has um, the CDB oils, which is prescribed by the, I think it's the oncology consultant up in Auckland. He also has other supplements as well, which are things like intravenous extracts from apricot kernels and the oral version, um, amigodagling or something. I'm not okay. sure how to pronounce it. Um, and then from a medical point of view, he's on 60 milligrams. He's on Cephalodol, 20 milligrams hourly. He takes norotriptyline for pain, uh, nerve pain and he was on antibiotics, but they've actually stopped at present. Mm -hmm. uh, my concern is that he's got multiple um, medical professionals involved. He's got the medical oncologist that he was under here, but now in Auckland. He's got the radiation oncologist, respiratory consultant. He's under two different integrative medicine doctors. And one of those did a muscle test on him and told him he had pleurisy, which he fixated on. And that also he needed to check his home environment because potentially it was the mould that was making him sick. Um, they recently moved house into this house. It's a very modern house. It doesn't appear to be any mould there. But he was fixated on the fact that it wasn't cancer that was causing his pain, and it was just pleurisy and the mould in the house. Um, he's got a history of atrial fibrillation in gout, and he previously had the DVT. Um, normally, I said John's fit and well, he plays sport, but over the last few months now, he's really lost weight, he's tired all the time. Um, he had an episode of about four or five weeks where he just slept the day. Very, very low in mood, and he described his depression as five out of ten. Um, he was completely fixated on these doctors, and now once he was told he never had pleurisy, he completely doesn't know what to believe now. He doesn't know what to think. Um, he doesn't. He just doesn't know where to go at all now. Um, John lives with his wife. They're a very strong couple. They talk well. Um, they've got three children: uh, twenty, eighteen, and their youngest daughter is fifteen but has learning difficulties and has got the comprehension of about an eight-year-old. They own their own business and have sold some of their business just to free up some finances to be able to work from home. And John's focus and his wife's focus is still on cure. They realise he's really unwell, but they just don't want to hear that potentially he's going to deteriorate and die potentially in the next few months. Um, they completely just believe everything the integrated doctors tell them. And they, when they first came to hospice, they were completely floundering because so many different people were involved and they just didn't know who to go to, what to believe and where to go to next. And I just wonder whether we have an obligation to tell John that he is dying despite doing all these alternatives. And if we were up front and spoke to John, um, would he be able to come to terms with the fact that he's dying and able to come to terms with coping mechanisms around his pending death? And they're the kind of questions I want answered, really. <laughs> Good questions, mate. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'll just put it out to our spoke sites if you have any uh, questions or clarifications um, that you would like to ask. I've, just, I'll just answer a question from Ali. Yes, it is a pseudonym, Ali. They've given him a, um, a different name. Uh, so any questions or clarifications? David? Oh, I was just wondering if anyone had actually shown him the x-ray so he could actually see it. It's not a pleasant thing to do. To be honest, I'm not sure whether he's actually seen the x-rays. I know on his last oncology appointment, they mentioned some extra um, metastases that John and his wife didn't know existed. And again, they were devastated when they heard about these. And when they asked the doctor why wasn't they told about them, 
the oncologist told them that they were fixed, they were focusing on the ones that they potentially could give chemotherapy to, and they didn't feel that they needed to know about these further meds. So I'm not sure that they have. Any other questions, clarifications from Brian or Tom? All right. All right. Uh, anyone in the hub team got any questions or things like to clarification on? From I, I do. Yeah. Um, when you said he when came to hospice, he struggled with uh, lots of people involved. What does he understand of? Um, have you had any sense of what he understands of being under hospice or how he rationalises being under hospice if he thinks he's got pleurisy and going to be cured? I, um, on my first visit, we went through all that. I mean, I just let them, you know, kind of offload about what was going on. I did explain to them that people are usually referred to hospice when they're palliative, and that often it means that time is short. Um, they understand that he's unwell, but they, I don't think they actually want to hear the words that he's dying. Um, I, last time I went to see him, he's, he's often in tears as well when I see him. Um, like I said, they are a strong couple. Unfortunately, his brother had arrived to visit prior to me turning up last time and came downstairs after seeing his brother and said to his wife, oh, he's not looking good. Unfortunately, that set the wife off because she didn't want to hear nothing negative. They had this huge family bust up and then the, the, the brother was thrown out the house and then I arrived and everyone was still up in, in arms. And, you know, I tried to explain to them that people you know, say these things, but not, you know what I mean, without actually understanding what they're saying and stuff. But, but um, yeah, John just, they know that they're unwell. And I just, I just wonder from my point of view, whether if we actually have that conversation, that actually you are dying, whether he'd be able to cope better because actually he's been told the truth. Mm -hmm. And we've done, you know, we've talked about counselling, um, he's open to counselling, but just not quite yet. We've um, talked about Rainbow Place for his youngest daughter, because and they do want that, but again, they don't want it just yet. So they're, they're happy, and they want to meet other people that are in the same position as them, but not in a forced environment. So it's really difficult. And I think John wants to meet other men, as opposed to maybe women, going through what he's going through. But it's, you know, often it's women that come to groups rather than lots of men that he finds that a bit difficult. Got a question from Tom. Just, just a, a difficult case, Gwyn. Um, uh, just to get my head right. So he, he's accepting that he's still got cancer, though. Yes. Yeah. It's cancer. more that the overall outlook is poor. Yeah. 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 Thank you. He just wants to be cured. He wants to keep living, which is yeah. a normal um, Stuart here. Uh, thanks, Gwen. I think part of it is um, just the semantics around the term dying. I mean, when I think of the word dying, if it was applied to me, I'd be thinking the last few days, and other people think of it, you know, you're dying from the day you're born. And, you know, so I think that could be part of it, is just understanding, you know, what, what he understands. You understanding, we understanding what he means by the term dying. Just a, a yeah. commentary. And I think I'm going to try and I'm going to try and have an appointment with him on his own to see whether he's different when his wife's not there because potentially she doesn't want to hear negative things either because they're both staying really positive and focused. Whether he might say more if she wasn't there as well, and you know, might be open to the conversation. But, you know, it's like when you got all these different. Um, doctors and medical people involved as well and you're hearing different things from different doctors you know who who does have that difficult conversation with him when he's ready to hear it hmm. when well, i'm just wondering if you've had a chance or maybe you could do it if you meet him on his own but have you asked what their understanding is of his illness and where things are at i haven't actually asked him that directly no yeah okay Anyone else have any questions? Okay, we might then officially move into some <laughs> recommendations this time. So anyone from those folks have any recommendations for Gwen, how she might 
approach this situation. Yep, Tom. I think I think what I'm hearing is is a guy who needs to have real rapport and trust with um, the person who's giving him information, and I'm, I'm hearing that perhaps a um, there was a breakdown of that between his usual oncologist if they felt that they hadn't been given information and these things cause an awful lot of damage and they seem small but they can really impact upon rapport um who do you think is uh, from a professional point of view is someone that they trust and, and might might be able to or, or, or be having willing to have these difficult conversations with and actually believe what they say is there a, is there a person be it his gp or um or another another individual who they really you know they, they've got a developed rapport and trust with i think the only person that at the moment that seems to be at the forefront for them is one of the um, integrated doctors that he goes to for ozone therapy and all this other you know, alternative therapy mm. um yeah i mean i've referred like he has been seen by one of the hospice doctors and i think you know, potentially that's something in the future that will happen again. Um, but yeah, apart from that, there's nobody that I'm not sure who who they would. Apart from this one guy that we mention a lot, I'm not sure who else they. Yeah. Yep, David. Up here, it's very easy. I talked to um, I don't know about the ozone doctors, but I talked to the um, osteopaths and the chiropractics a lot. Um, can you talk to the ozone doctor? Can you contact him and say, look, what's going on? This is what we've found. Um, what are you doing? Is there any contact between professionals here? Um, there hasn't been. I suppose it's something we could look at in the future. But yeah, certainly, yeah we certainly yeah, haven't done it so far. But we Because you're all seen from a different sheet at the moment. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm. I think that's a really good point. I think that um, we uh, we might list them and think of them as not the integrative or alternative practitioners as not part of the team, but particularly when the patient sees them as part of their team and if they're the person they trust, then they're, and they may well have the same approach as us. I caught up with um, a nurse at hospice conference who's in a vitamin C clinic giving IV vitamin C and she said they're frequently telling patients about palliative care, about hospice, encouraging them to get on the books. And they're doing some great work. And I think that's a part of the workforce that we don't realize that we hear the patient's view of what the integrated medicine person told them. But just like the way, the way we hear what the oncologist told them, it's not always what they actually see. So, so leveraging on that to um, have the person the patient trusts most, give them that information and, and perhaps getting patients permission to send our correspondence to them or talk to them so that it's really carefully done. Say, hey, you, can I talk to your ozone therapist and let them know what I'm up to so that we can work together. And maybe when you talk to the ozone therapist, you're like, yeah, I can see he's getting worse and this is pointless. Um, and they're trying to give the same message as us. So yeah, coming together. Um, one of the questions I had one to just to think about is uh, and one of the points you made in the case was that he they want to remain positive and hopeful and there's a concern that if they talk about the fact that he is dying that they'll lose hope and I'm just wondering do and, and maybe this has to come after he um, uh, you know, gets more on board with his prognosis. Is what other hopes does he have, and that they have that they can focus on, rather than this hope of a cure and a hope of living longer, yeah. just to give them, some, you know, look at it differently. So, what do you hope to achieve? That's realistic, and that um, in the next twelve months, rather yeah. than the next twelve years. Yeah, just. I think it's difficult because um, you know, and, and like we don't ever want to take that hope away from people. Um, but like they like they've got a house down in Wanaka as well, and they they keep going down to Wanaka trying to set up the house down there ready for them. And you know they do go away regularly, and yeah, it's really hard. They just they just think that we're going to get through this and go to that house down at Wanaka. Really, yeah. There's no kind of short term, apart from 
getting through this, you know. Yeah. The, um, Viv here, Gwen, it's um, a timing for him too, not just, isn't it? Because if he did allow himself to have somebody to talk to like a counsellor, the chances are that he would admit that deep down he does know that things aren't in a good shape and he could be avoiding that because he doesn't want to face that. It's, it's a whole cycle really, isn't it? And oh. so, you know, he, he will hold on as they will for as long as they need to until more pennies drop. And I think it's a very careful timing. Um, yeah, which is determined by our clients, by our patients. I think that's, um, sorry Debbie here, I think that's the key thing, that, that the question is we feel uncomfortable. It's not our agenda, it's his agenda. We, and there are steps to take. I think we have to be careful that we don't move people through more steps than they can handle at any one time. So the, the whole hope thing being that there are, I, I know that someone's written about this, I think four stages of hope that people hope for a cure, people hope for a longer time, people hope that symptoms are well managed, people hope for a peaceful death. We can't go from hoping I'm going to be cured to hoping my death will be peaceful in one step. But we can signpost to people by asking, like Wayne said, you know, what is it that you're hoping for now? And then asking the next question, and if that wasn't possible, what would you be hoping for? So we're not saying, and if your hope doesn't happen, we're saying, what else are you hoping for if that one isn't doable? Um, and it just moves them one step at a time. So I think, I think that's a one way to play it. Signposting to people, you know, that when they're saying, I'm hoping it's all going to be okay. And I'm worried that that, that may not be the case. What would we do if that was the case? You know, like you don't need to say, well, clearly you're wrong, <laughs> but, but just signposting to people that there might be a different alternative to the one they're focusing on. And how would they play it if that was the case? Um, I think David's comment about um, the, the evidence showing, showing him pictures, it is difficult. And I know this gentleman, when there are a lot of people um, outside of our area, so we actually don't have access to the imaging because he's had scans done in private um, and scans done out of our DHB. But, but there's a role for us to try and find that. Um, and if he wants to see it, to show him those pictures. Um, I agree with Lara's comment about communicating with the alternative practitioners um, and we have copied them into correspondence, but, but physically having a conversation with them is far more powerful than sending bits of paper. Um, so I think that's, that's really important. And then generalising things for patients, saying, you know, so that it's not as frightening if we take it off, this is your individual situation, you're dying. You know, of all the people we see with this type of cancer, this is really common and this is what often happens next. And this is, you know, so that it gives them permission to normalise it a little bit and to see that what they're experiencing is not outside of the norm. And that those can be ends to having those conversations. I think the biggest thing for this man is going to be a communication and taking it in the steps that he's comfortable with um, and making sure that we're not managing our own need to give information or our, our, the pace at which we want to be progressing this because it's not about us. Trust is time. So. Yeah, yes, Brian. The, um Somebody's mentioned before about separating him, his agenda and her agenda, and I wasn't um, clear if that that's not happened yet, Quim. We don't really know what he thinks, we, but we certainly know what she thinks. Yeah, so, so, like, I've only met with them both together, and, you know, they, like she says to me, oh, we know that he's really unwell, and, um, but, yeah, it, I haven't had separate conversations them to see what they both are actually feeling and things you know it's just a good time so far yeah yeah that'll happen yeah. has to happen really yeah anybody else have any other suggestions or recommendations hmm. I think most of it's been covered, but uh, sometimes it can be helpful to ask 
at what point would you like me to uh, sort of explore when they might want more information or um, say if I see some changes that I think things are not going so well at what point would you like me to you know you, you keep talking about hopefulness I haven't worded it very well but that kind of asking permission from them for in the future if you think time's getting shorter to let them know or um, how would you like that to be signaled if it wasn't going so well um, or, or sort of as, as Debbie saying if you want to talk about prognosis or what might help happen in the future um, we can have that conversation any time um, that sort of making offers um, and I did have a patient a while back who was clearly dying and didn't want to have a conversation about um, how, what his prognosis was and he looked like he only had days um, and I tried to get him to reflect on how he changed in the last few weeks he'd gone from mobile to bed bound in a month and he's like no nah, I'm just the same as I was a month ago so I said well you know if in a hypothetical scenario you only had a tiny bit of time what would you want to do and he said spend time with my wife and I thought oh she's there she's seen it for okay so it, it, again just taking Debbie's idea a bit further um, when would you want me to tell you those things? What would you like to have the heads up for? And I, and I wonder whose hope it is. Um, is it the wife's hope because she's got young children and can't imagine her life without her husband? Or is it his hope that he doesn't leave this fabulous family that he's got and he's built up? And, um, yeah, so you can perhaps yeah, work on that and find out whose hope it is, then perhaps you have an opportunity to yeah, bring it down, bring it back and have the conversation. Yeah, Tom? There's some really good points. I, I think um, when you, just, just reflecting on all the things that are being said, we feel this urge to, to do something. But sometimes I think we still have an amazing role just to walk beside people. And I think what Viv said that, that this couple and their family are, they're going to come to a point where some, the penny will drop or something will happen. And, and, uh, and, but it is going to be on their terms. And I think Debbie always makes a very valid point about us not treat, running to our own, what we feel we should be doing, but just by being there, Gwen, you're going to be, you know, by being that, that extra layer of support in the background, a point of contact, they will come to you or to the team when they are ready. And I think that there's huge value just by being involved in that respect. I think, uh, thank you, Tom. I, I want to affirm that too, and, and really just say thank you, Gwen, for the work you're doing. Yes. Um, and while, while it's not about us, it is important that we look after ourselves too. It is a tricky situation and it's difficult when our feeling of how things could go might be different to theirs. So just making sure that you're looking after yourself, that as a team we debrief about these patients, that you have people that you're um, seeing, whether it's supervision or whether it's your, um, you know, people above you at work that you can talk to. Um, I don't think these situations should be managed in isolation. So thank you for the great job you're doing keep talking to each other. Yeah. Cool. Um, thank you again for that presentation, uh, Gwen. Quite challenging. Um, I just need to apologise to Brian. I didn't give you a summary of the recommendations that were made at the end of the case, but we have written all those down, so we'll send you some. Uh, so just, I will do that for um, Gwen. So some of the things that I've written down as recommendations um, the first one is around developing rapport and trust with um, this man and his wife and finding out who he trusts with regards to other clinicians involved and communicating with that person or those people around how best to discuss the situation um, and who's best to do that. Uh, find out what he understands about his illness and prognosis, probably more than what he's betting on, we suspect. Um, the possibility of getting a counsellor involved to discuss more in depth his thoughts, feelings and expectations and potential for his wife. And hopefully, uh, I think further down the line, maybe with Rainbow Place, especially for their uh, youngest. Um, focusing on his agenda as well and moving carefully through the stages with them, um, maybe using the signposting around the different hopes. 
uh, using an approach of generalizing. So talking about how we might work with it or what we might expect with other patients with his diagnosis to help again sort of identify some uh, opportunities for him to um, raise questions or him, his wife to raise questions or concerns. Uh, I, did, I really like the idea of talking to them about when they would like to hear stuff. So if you mm -hmm. see things changing, when and how would they like to have that information given to them. Um, and then uh, the last one I wrote down was making sure, because it's a challenging situation and this kind of cases where you can't easily talk to the person and their um, family about what is going on because we know a lot and we've seen it a lot, but their expectations are different. So um, being able to support each other and the team and, and talk about it and debrief about it just to make sure that everyone's internally we're coping with it. Um, so again, we'll summarise those and send it to you on email. Um, and thanks again, Brian, for your case. Also quite an interesting and challenging case again. So just to finish off then, our, um, our next uh, ECHO clinic is the 15th of November, same time. We are um, anticipating having a few more GP practices involved. Um, and we're also hoping at that one for the didactic presentation that we'll have um, Dr. Megan Doherty from Canada is visiting us and we are going to try and co-opt her into presenting on a paediatric palliative care topic. It's on our agenda for her, it's just not maybe on hers yet. <laughs> oh, she knows, great. Um, She's still coming. <laughs> so thank you very much for participating. It's been really good and really great case discussions uh, once again. It's been great having you online as well. Ali, I hope you found it interesting. We're interested in your feedback as well. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. And we will see you at 7.30 on the 15th of November. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>